Well, today we are finishing up our series on grateful, thankful, blessed. But before we get into that, I do want to draw your attention. If you're visiting maybe for the first, second, or third time with us, uh, there's a Connect card on the seat back in front of you. You can just grab that and you can fill out your details there. It takes about 30 seconds to fill that out legibly. We'd love to have a record of your being with us. We won't harass you in any way, but uh, would love to just say, hey, thanks for, for being with us. Also, who, who was at the game last night? Who, who went? Who is there? and you're here this morning, uh, we have a free coffee. Chase, I'm going to give this to you to give it away since you already have a coffee. Why don't we go hand that out? And again, thank you all for uh, right over here, over here. Let's appreciate all those who are here this morning in church. Great to have you. Man, what a game though. Dude, who, I, I couldn't believe like seven overtimes. I thought they would go into eight. Now, I'm a little bit of a Joe Burrow fan because he played for Ohio State, but I wasn't rooting. I was rooting for him, but not for that team. <laughs> so, man, what a good day. It was a good day for my Buckeyes too. So, he dropped 62. That's a lot of points. Just saying. So, 74. That's a lot of, that's the, the basketball score for a football game is what, what you witnessed last night. But man, I, that is impressive. Who stayed for the entire game, like all the way through, all seven overtimes? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you are dedicated people. I love it. That is, that is absolutely amazing. Well, we, we enjoy, we love some college football. So we actually, we were driving back from our Thanksgiving uh, trip and we streamed our game in the van, which was a new experience for us, but we got to watch the game. I didn't get to watch because I was driving, but we watched the game, and I listened to it, and I may have cheated a little bit, but don't tell any troopers, you know. So it was fun. We at least didn't miss out. The last time I drove on a Thanksgiving holiday, and which I normally don't do this because it's the game, the Ohio State-Michigan is the big rivalry game for for the Big Ten, and really for college sports, but that's <laughs> probably outside of the SEC, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, so the last time I did that, we lost to Michigan, which I would think we beat them 14 the last 15 or something like that, crazy. So I was really nervous yesterday about driving and missing the game, because uh, I thought potentially we could lose, and I thought we were going to lose, I, I really did, but... It didn't, didn't work out that. That's right. We, we can do a little O, O, H. No, and you, you're not going to participate this morning, are you? That's, and I don't blame you. That's okay. But did everyone have a nice Thanksgiving? Did you have a good, eat some turkey? Who braved Black Friday shopping? Is there anybody here that did a little bit of that? Man, you guys, you're Cyber Monday people, I take it. Far wiser, I think. We actually went out into the hustle and bustle. It was... Awesome. <laughs> I'm just saying. Walmart on Black Friday is, it, if you've never experienced it, I just encourage you next year, take advantage of the opportunity because it is life altering. And you'll, you walk away filled with a lot more patience and all of that. So you, it's a, it'll enhance your prayer life, if nothing else, if you go out on Black Friday and do shopping and stuff. But it is such a great reminder. This is one of the things I love about America, that we have this collective pause to, to take time out, even in the midst of that. And I know some, some people are trying to rebrand Thanksgiving as Thanksgetting. So it makes messages like these all the more important because really taking time out to, to consider and to be thankful and grateful for all the, the blessings we have, even to, to be in America and to have the freedoms that we have and just to Bring, be with family and friends. It's a, it's a great time to just reflect on life and to thank God for, for what we have. So let, I'll give, give you a couple turkey stats. Do you want some turkey stats? Here, here we go. So um, plus or minus 116 million households in America. That's a lot. 46 million turkeys are typically consumed at Thanksgiving. Jack has this joke, it was told by uh, Becca to him, and says, what do you call a turkey the day after Thanksgiving? Yeah, you're lucky. Oh. It wasn't, okay. 88% of Americans will eat turkey. That's, a, again, a lot. Who ate turkey? Who, who's a tur- who, what else would you eat on Thanksgiving? I just, oh, steak. Steak, barbecue steak. Tamales. 
Help me, Jesus. I will say this. On our way home, we had uh, Boudin. Is that how you say it? <laughs> On the way home. And we stopped, and we had Boudin balls. Is that right? And we had Cracklin. First time for any of it. So you should be very proud of me. We're, we're expanding new experiences and all the rest. So <clears throat> I didn't just eat turkey, but we fried turkey. It was very good. Jaden made two pumpkin pies and she made a key lime pie, which is very nice. And I don't eat key lime, so I just focused on the pumpkin. And there was more of it for me, so I was very happy about that. All right, I think we need to pray because we're getting very carnal right now. <clears throat> all right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your grace. God, we thank you that we have the opportunity to... to Come around your word. I pray that you would open our hearts, that you would anoint our ears to hear, anoint our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. We love you. We honor you. And we are very grateful, God. We're so thankful for your son, Jesus. And we thank you uh, for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So we've been in this series, Grateful, Thankful, Blessed. Uh, We started out looking at the enemy of generosity is selfishness, and then we we talked about that the result of generosity is God's blessing, and then last week we looked at the motivation behind generosity is gratitude. And obviously in in Scripture, there's like 2,000 Scriptures on finance and stewardship and things, 500 on prayer, 500 on faith. So obviously God wants us to get the message that Giving's a part of life, and you can't talk about great relationships and not talk about giving. You can't talk about salvation and not talk about giving. You can't talk about uh, God's grace and not talk about giving. Giving's a part of our life. It impacts every single element, every aspect of who we are. Giving, having a spirit of generosity impacts it all. And so that's why it's important to have the conversation. And this week, uh, I think of it like this. If you know that something's really important and key to your future, i.e., having a grateful heart, having a thankful heart, you're going to produce a a generous heart is what we looked at. The motivation for generosity is is a heart filled with gratitude. And out of that comes that blessed life, that thing. What what does the a blessed life look like? What does a blessed heart look like? Well, it's having the supernatural power working on your behalf, which we all want, right? There's no, I don't think there's a person in this room. And if, if I ask, do you want God's favor following you around and and having his blessing on your life, I think we would all say yes. But when we have a generous and a thankful heart, a grateful and a thankful heart, we will have a generous heart and then we will have a blessed life. I didn't say we'll get rich. It's not about that because there are a lot of rich people who don't live a blessed life. They got craziness, might have a lot of money, but craziness all the way around. And a person who's living a blessed life is not just about that. It's about your heart. It's about your family. It's about your health. It's about all the aspects of life. And so if gratitude is a key to living a blessed life, who do you think is going to want to challenge a spirit of gratitude in your life? It's not your friend. It's the enemy is going to come after our heart. Because giving at the end of the day is all about what? It's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. And gr- gratitude flows out of our heart. And life will chip at us. Life will chip away. Life will beat us up a little bit. Life has the capacity to chip away at our hearts, to get us to a place where we're no longer flowing with the spirit of gratitude, but we're actually living kind of like oh, shrinking beat up, banged up. The enemy knows gratitude is key to all of us living a blessed life. And so there are things that we have to be aware of, not afraid of, but be aware of that can challenge a heart of gratitude. That's what we're going to focus on today. So we're going to look at how do we intentionally keep an awareness of things that can happen in life that the enemy is going to try to target your heart because out of the heart flows the wellspring of life, Proverbs And he's going to do things that are going to chip away at a spirit of gratitude, at a spirit of thankfulness. Why? Because at the end, if he can strip us of a grateful and a thankful heart, there won't be a generous heart. There'll be a selfish heart. And there won't be a blessed life. There'll be a life that's all consumed with themselves. And so, not to be afraid of, but simply to be aware of some of the things that we have to... uh, that we have to be on the lookout. So Facebook did a little ad, uh, I think a couple years ago, and they had their top 10 things that people were thankful for. Do you want to hear them? Top 10. Facebook top 10. Here we go. Now, one of these is a little bit of a cheat. You'll figure it out. So number one was uh, friends, and then family, and then health, 
And then family and friends. I mean, come on, people. Like, that's the same thing as the other. Job, husband, children, roof over to their head, life, and music. And again, Facebook, very casual uh, top 10 things that people were thankful for. It's amazing, though, when you look at that, the bulk of that list circles around relationships, circles around the, the closest people in our world that we're thankful for. I want to ask you, what is your top 10? I would encourage you this week, here's your homework. I'm giving it a little bit early today. This week, think of your top 10 things that you're thankful for in your life. Just take a moment to intentionally say, you know what, I'm thankful for these 10 things, and it could be, it'll start a, a gusher of things that you're thankful for. You don't have to stop at 10, but do at least 10 things that you are thankful for. What are your top 10 things of being thankful for in this season? I love Thanksgiving because it helps us to keep our heart in a good place. But we've all met people, and maybe at times have been people, where having a, a spirit of gratitude wasn't in the equation. People who have kind of shriveled up a little bit and anything and everything in life is just tough and bad and not good. And it happens where we kind of, we shrink back. So we're going to look now at some things that, some ways that, that just to be aware of in life when it comes to guarding your heart, when it, when it comes to keeping and maintaining a spirit of gratitude. So here's the first thing. Why do people lose appreciation and thankfulness? Why do we lose the spirit of gratitude in our life? Number one is this, that we were wronged. Maybe you were wronged. Something happened that shouldn't have happened in your life. Maybe it was abuse. Maybe somebody, infidelity, you got cheated in a business deal. Whatever it is, something happened and it was wrong. You shouldn't have happened. You were wronged. It can strip us of a spirit of gratitude if we're not careful. But listen to this. This is pretty amazing. This is Jesus the night he was betrayed. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and, th- and when he had given what? He gave a pity party? He gave a, oh, woe is me? No, he gave thanks and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Isn't it amazing that even in the midst of his betrayal, Jesus gave thanks? This is a moment of betrayal, a great moment for humanity, not a great moment for Jesus and Judas. But in the middle of what he knew was the Last Supper, He didn't go, woe is me. He actually said, God, in the middle of the challenge, in the midst of betrayal, I know it's coming. He gave thanks. Now, let me be your pastor this morning. People are going to burn you. It will happen. You will be disappointed. Someone's going to rip you off. Someone's going to treat you poorly. Something's going to happen. There will be times in life where, like Jesus, you get betrayed. I mean, think of Joseph, another great Bible hero. The Old Testament, Joseph had this amazing dream, dream to dream, shared his dream with his brothers about how they would all be bowing down to him one day. The next thing he knows, he finds himself in a pit, put there by his brothers, gets sold into slavery, eventually gets taken to Potiphar's house, gets a little cooler all of a sudden, a little quieter. Gets put in a place, put in charge of a lot of stuff, does exceedingly well, then has a false accusation against him, gets put in prison. Joseph could have been really, really angry and really, really bitter. He was wronged by his brothers. One of the most beautiful moments in Scripture is when Joseph comes face to face with his brothers. And in that moment, Joseph had the power to destroy their lives. He was the number two in charge of all of Egypt. And the Bible says when they came before him, he went, he went away and he cried. And when he came back, he didn't say, hey, take these guys out off of their heads. He played with them a little bit. I think he just a little cheeky. But in the end, he said, what you meant for evil, God intended for good. And he didn't He didn't embrace the wrong. He looked at what God could do in the midst of the wrong. He didn't keep 
a heart that was bitter. In the midst of being wrong, Joseph gives us a great example to follow, as does Jesus, that don't let, and things will happen, guys. It will, it will chip away at your heart. Disappoint, well, I thought disappointment. It will happen. We've got to guard our heart. The second thing that we have to be aware of is unrealistic expectations. I'll put it like this. I like to frame it in this way. Anytime we do premarital or do counseling, uh, I love to, you have expectation here. And if your expectation is up here, but your reality is here, guess what's in the middle? A whole lot of disappointment, right? A whole lot of disillusionment, a whole lot of unrealistic expectations not being met. What happens when expectations are not met? Disappointment, disillusionment, bitterness. I thought it would go this way, but God, and it doesn't. I was convinced this business would succeed, but it doesn't. I was convinced that our marriage would make it, but it doesn't. Expectation here, reality here, the difference is just hard yards, right? Difficult moments. I think of, I love to put flesh and blood on biblical characters. I think of David and his relationship with Jonathan, which was, these guys were best friends, did life. I can imagine, I mean, I've got best friends where you sit down, you dream together, you talk about, man, what, what could life look like? I can imagine that David sat down with Jonathan and said, man, what will it be like when we rule the kingdom together? Want to be amazing? Here's Jonathan who recognized what was on David's life, gave him his armor, and said, I know you're the one who's going to be king. His dad, Jonathan's, Jonathan was in line to become the king, but he recognized what was on David's life. He knew David would be the king. Best friends. Jonathan saved David from his dad, helped him out. I imagine that they had moments where they said, oh man, what, what will it be like when we're ruling the kingdom together? And yet Jonathan died in battle with his dad. His loyalty to his father ended his life. I imagine that that was a hard moment for David. David. Now, David went on to rule. He was one of the great kings in all of Israel, but he was human. He had emotions just like you, just like me. He had to navigate loss in a big way. A dream, a possibility, an expectation, a hope that is unmet. I have watched people through the years. (sighs) No, we had a, a good friend who dreamed of being a park ranger, like a state park, you know, the park systems, dreamed of this, like this was his dream job. Waited a long time for the opportunity. Finally got the opportunity to apply and go through the process and was in the middle of the process and then he couldn't make it. Couldn't cut it. There were aspects of the job he just couldn't do. Physically, didn't have the capacity any longer to do the job. You know what? Those are, that's a hard moment. That's a, an expectation here and a reality here. That's a moment to navigate. And we all have those moments in life where we have an expectation here and, and the reality of our life or our circumstance gives us something very, very different. Listen, just guard your heart. Be aware. Those moments are going to happen in life. It's inevitable. They're going to happen. We just have to be aware of them. Number three is this unforgiveness. If we want to get things sloppy in our lives, if we want to mess things up, keeping unforgiveness in our heart, boy, just do that and find out how how things work. It'll go bad. Unforgiveness is like a poison. It doesn't just poison you. It touches those who are around you as well. This is what Hebrews 12, 14, and 15 says. It says, strive for peace with everyone and for the, the holiness without which none, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. That's what a, a root of, when we have unforgiveness in our life, it leads to a bitter root. And a bitter root hurts a lot of people doesn't hurt just you. It, it hurts the people around you as well. We've got to, we've got to, uh, 
like the idea of keeping short accounts with people. Like forgive quickly. Don't let things go unsaid that need to be said. If you have a relationship in your life that needs some reconciliation, I mean, pray for wisdom, get good guidance if it's a, a really difficult situation. But man, we, you, you be responsible for your heart. Whose heart is it? It's not their heart. It's your heart. We're responsible for our heart. We're responsible to God to live a life that is filled with forgiveness as he instruct us, instructs us, not unforgiveness. Because when we live with unforgiveness, inevitably, bitterness is going to surface. And when bitterness surfaces, it's going to impact your world around you. I'm not saying this stuff is all easy. It's simply to be aware of, right? We got to make sure that we keep our hearts in a good place. Number four is self-centeredness or selfishness. And we talked about this in James, James chapter three. It says, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure, and then peaceable, gentle, uh, open to reason, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial, and sincere. Again, that's why do we do a series, Grateful, Thankful, Blessed? Because it, it helps us to realize life is not just about us. But a selfish heart is going to lack a spirit of gratitude. You know, we're not entitled to anything. Thank God for his grace. He gives us great things. We're not entitled to anything. People don't owe you a thing. God doesn't owe you anything. He's already accomplished everything he's going to do. When Jesus died on the cross, he gave it all. He set us up. But we can live a selfish, self-centered kind of a life. But you know what? We don't have to train for it, what we've already talked about. We're born this way. I don't have to train you in how to be selfish. You don't have to train yourself. We're born with a nature that leans that direction. But what we can do is be intentional to make sure our heart doesn't stay that way. And that's what God desires for each and every one of us. That we wouldn't live a selfish life, but we would live a generous life. Why did God create giving? Because he knew we have a tendency to be selfish. And what does giving do? It's the antidote to selfishness. Why? Because it's not about us. It's about our heart. It's about recognizing that we're not going to make the, the world just about us. Here's the fifth thing that we have to be aware of. The pain of sadness, loss of joy, and grief. We will all face times in our life where it just, it just hurts. That's why we sing songs like we did. I know the night won't last. My heart will sing again. God, you've been faithful. Well, we're just, you're reminding your own spirit of who God is in your life. That even in the midst of grief, of pain, a loss of joy, if you have been a believer for any amount of time, you'll go, they call this the, the old school, the, the dark night of the soul. Or there's a season where you just go, God, I, I don't feel you. I don't sense you. I don't, I don't know where you are. It hurts. I feel numb. We probably have all been there. Some of us might be there right now. You just, your heart literally feels numb. You know, God, I just want to, I want to feel, I want to sense you again. I want to have that, that sense of relationship. Loss, grief, a lack of joy. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8 says this. It says that for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. That's 
life. There will be a time where pain comes in. In the middle of that season, I want to encourage you, keep your heart soft towards Jesus. If that's you this morning, listen, God, God knows what you're facing. He's not, he's not unaware of the challenge of your heart. He loves you. He is for you. There is grace. His grace is sufficient. Set your eyes and your focus on him. Let your trust and your hope be on the name of Jesus. And eventually, the sun will shine again. Joy will come. May not come tomorrow, but it'll come. God is good. God loves you. You know, even the great prophet Samuel struggled with this. Samuel, when, when God told Samuel, hey, I'm, Saul is done. His kingdom is over. His time as king is, is over. And Samuel, he just grieved. He grieved so much and so long that God eventually said, hey, man, get up. It's time for you to go and anoint the new king. Stop. Rise up. Go forth. You know, sometimes in our life, when we go through challenges, and I, I'm all, listen, hear my heart. I'm all for taking a break when we need it. But one of the greatest ways for us to move forward in life is to help somebody else navigate one of the things that we're navigating. So God doesn't waste our pain. God doesn't, doesn't waste what happens in our life. He redeems it. Not just for us, but for others as well. So we have to make sure that in the midst of pain, sadness, and a loss of joy, we keep a heart that is still tender towards God. So how do we keep a grateful, thankful, and blessed heart? Number one is this. We live a life of love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 5 says this. It says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It, doesn't, it is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Keeps no record of wrong. That's tough sometimes. I think it's easier to keep a record of wrong than it is to just live like Jesus did. Who God who forgives our sin as far as the east is from the west. That's no record of wrong. He just forgives us. <laughs> Done. But love keeps no... Re- so what does that mean for us? It means when you have been wronged, there comes a point in time you have to stop repeating it. It can't be the center of every conversation you have. I've, I've been in ministry long enough. I've done life long enough where when hurt happens, it's amazing when you get wronged, how every conversation you are in, that thing comes to the very center eventually. We all have stories that will make each other cry. We do. At some point in time, you got to just stop repeating it. Stop, bring, stop making it the Lord of your life. Because when it dominates every thought, when it dominates every conversation, when it dominates the atmosphere of your life, guess who's the Lord of your life? That wrong, not Jesus. At some point in our walk, we got to live a life of love. What does a life of love? It, love? it means I'm not keeping a record of wrong. I'm not denying that a wrong took place, mind you. And I'm not going to let that same wrong happen again. It's not living like that, but it's recognizing I'm not going to let it dominate my heart any longer. I'm going to live a life of love. I'm going to say, Jesus, help me. (laughs) Because you're going to need his help. Forgiveness is a choice. Living a life of love is a choice. Choosing not to have that at the center of every conversation is a daily choice. But boy, when we live a life of love, it opens up the power of heaven on our behalf. 
And it guards a grateful heart. Here's the thing. When we keep that as the main focus all the time, it's impossible to be thankful. You can't have a heart filled with gratitude and a heart filled with anger at the same time. Something's got to give. In other words, it's stripping away your capacity to be thankful for what you do have by only focusing on what we don't have or a wrong that was committed that, that removed the possibility of something else. Guard our heart. We got to live a life of love. Number two is to recognize the contributions of others. I, I love this because it, it, it helps us to realize, hey, I'm not an island unto myself. It's to recognize the people in your life who helped you get to where you are today. And none of us are without those people in our life. It's recognizing the contributions of how do you keep a spirit of gratitude. And maybe you've done a lot on your own. The American spirit is I'm pulling up by my bootstraps. I'm making things happen. I'm a self-made man. All of that. But even if you're a self-made man, I mean, you use God's resources to be self-made. So you're really not that self-made. Other people have helped us along the way. How do we cultivate a spirit of gratitude? By recognizing those contributions along the way. Of not making everything just about what I've done, what I've accomplished, what I'm owed, what I'm due. It other people. When we start to look at life and say, man, There are a lot of people in my life who've helped me to get where I am today. Little contributions, little seeds sown, little conversations had throughout life that helped you maybe get a revelation of something or have a new idea or a new framework or a new reference point of how to move forward. We have people in our lives who have helped us to get where we are. And when we take time to acknowledge them, it just helps us keep a heart of gratitude. Again, we're not entitled to it. And we recognize the, what other people have done. It helps us move forward. And finally is this, you have to remind yourself what God has done. Psalm 103, one of my favorite passages, especially around times of thanksgiving. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all of your disease, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you. With good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. It's just recognizing what God has done. God has forgiven us, He set us on a new path. God has redeemed us from the pit. God is like He did for Lazarus when we were dead in our sins. God raised us out of that to new life in Him. Man, we have so much to be thankful for. And when we recognize, just simply say, God, I'm going I'm to live a life of love. I'm going to recognize the contributions of others. I'm going to recognize what Jesus, what God has already done. I can live a life that keeps a spirit of gratitude. It doesn't shrink me back all back to myself, but allows me to, to see the bigger picture of what God wants to do. Psalm 103, forget not all his benefits. Forgives all our sins. Heals all our diseases. Man, there are so many benefits in God. So this morning, I want to remind us, the enemy is after your heart. God's after your heart. The enemy is after your heart. He knows that if he can strip us of gratitude and a thankful spirit, he can strip us of the blessing of God. Don't let him do it. So one It's just to be aware. Life's going to hit us. When it hits us, how do we respond? Let's choose now what that looks like. So when the moment comes, we're already prepared. And then we can continue to do the things necessary to cultivate a spirit of generosity, to cultivate a, a spirit that is gracious, one that is thankful, that has a spirit of gratitude, That when people meet us, they recognize, hey, there's just something different about that person. Boy, they've been through a lot. 
But when I talk to them, they bleed hope, not resentment. That's simply Jesus. You can't do that on your own. So I want to encourage you this morning. I don't know how you came into church. I don't know what life has delivered to you recently. But God loves you. And he's for you. He's got a great plan. He's got a great purpose for your life. This morning, be reminded, hey, there's so much he's done for you. He's died on a cross. He was risen. Forgiven our sins. He helps us move forward when we feel like, ah, I don't know how. His grace will carry us. If that's you this morning, you say, Jason, yeah, I recognize today I've let my heart stray a little bit. I've, I've gotten too focused on maybe some of the challenges and not on who Jesus is and what he's accomplished in my life. Come on. God loves you. Or maybe this morning you'd say, I've, I've, I've never asked or invited Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I've just lived my way. God loves you. God's for you. He's not against you. He's not mad. He's not waiting for an opportunity to hit you over the head with something. Not looking for you to screw up. That's not who God is. The Bible says it's his kindness that leads men to repentance. God loves you. He is for you this morning. Maybe say, Jason, yeah, I, I once served Jesus. I once had a relationship with him. But if I know today, if I took an honest evaluation of my life, I couldn't say I'm serving him right now. Come home. Come back. Recognize today all the benefits that God has for you. Freedom. Forgiveness. Healing. He's for you. So right now, I'm going to ask every person, if you just bow your head and close your eyes. If that's you, if you say, Jason, yeah, I'm, you're talking to me. I need Jesus in my life. I need to make him the Lord of my life. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand up high enough and long enough for me to see it. We're not going to embarrass you in any way. We would never do that. People make this decision every week in the life of our church. Simply coming home, simply acknowledging, yeah, I need Jesus. I need him. More than ever, I need him. If that's you this morning, you say, Jason, yeah, I need to come home. I'm going to count to three, and when I get there, I'm going to ask you to do something. Just raise your hand up high enough and long enough for me to see it. We just acknowledge you. We just want to know who we're praying with. One, God loves you. God is for you. He sees you. He knows you. He's for you. Two, the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God's not looking to beat you up. He's simply looking to welcome you home. Three, just raise your hand up high enough and long enough for me to see it. I see a hand here. Are there any others? I see another hand over here, and a hand over here, and a hand over here. Thank you, Jesus. Are there others this morning? You say, yeah, I just need to come home. I just need to renew my, I see a hand there. That's awesome, man. God loves you so much. He is for you. Now, why don't we do this? We're going to, say a prayer to you. Why don't we thank God for all those who raised their hands this morning. It's awesome. May it be the thing we always celebrate. God loves you. He is for you. And we're going we're gonna to pray this prayer together and then uh, continue on. But we'll do everything you let us do to help you move forward in a relationship with Jesus. You know, we're not going to call you at six o'clock in the morning or show up at your door, but anything you let us do, we're going to help you move forward. Got a couple great things that happen. We have our next step classes uh, that, that you can attend. We also have a following Jesus class that's on Wednesday night at seven o'clock. You can participate in that as well. But whatever you do, just keep coming back. That's the biggest thing. Just make, make it a pattern of your life to be in God's house and be around people who love Jesus, who can help you continue to move forward. We all need those people in our life. Amen? Well, let's pray. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for your grace. I invite you into my heart to be the Lord of my life. Thank you for forgiving me, for setting me free. I love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One more time, why don't we give God a round of applause for those who made that decision.
So proud of you.